down there at Queens downtown. I had to clarify that one with Pastor Clay. I went and saw her there on Tuesday. So be praying uh, for her and the family that the Lord would do a miracle. Pray for Solomon. And I, isn't it tomorrow? It is tomorrow. Pray for Solomon. He had a little minor setback last week on Tuesday. Everything happened on Tuesday. <laughs> He had a minor setback. He had some banding done, and so he's going to have a he's going to have a test tomorrow. So be praying for Solomon. Um, and one of my you guys remember Tommy McCurdy? Pray for his wife. She has an operation next week too. We got all these things going on. Be in prayer. 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 Work. Prayer changes things. I love that. That prayer changes things. And I want you guys. I'm going to share with you guys. Pray for something else. We have hit a little speed bump in our building process. Corey gave me a call on, what is it? Today is Sunday. We're here. Well, today is Sunday. Corey gave me a call on Friday and said, you know what? The city has turned back our permit um, because we have to go back before the neighborhood board to get a CUP amendment, which just pushes back our whole timeline by like a month. So be praying, um, be praying this week that we would find favor with the city we would find favor with the neighborhood board i've emailed i've talked to the guy at the board we're trying to get on the on the agenda there in february so that's next month that's like right around the corner it's already going to be february i can't even believe it like where where is this year going tomorrow's christmas for those of you that are keeping track just make sure to buy your presents now i mean black friday thanksgiving is coming no. but be praying please um our next worship and prayer night is going to be at my house there the sunday night the last sunday in february february 23rd so i'd like to encourage you guys to come out there's a lot of things going on and especially with this building project we would really uh, appreciate your prayers uh as you guys just pray for the Lord's will to be done here on this property. So with that, would you guys just join me? There are so many things to pray for. I just want to take a moment as we begin this morning to pray over all of these things that are going on. So Father, we do commit ourselves to you. Lord, we lift up Belen to you there in the in Queens. God, would you touch her? We pray your healing touch be upon her, God. We pray for comfort for the family, especially Gabe and the sons, as it was just such a trying uh, with Nathaniel's wedding last night. Uh, Lord, we just uh, lift up the whole Marquez family to you. Ask that you bless them, Lord, and give them your peace that surpasses understanding, guarding their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we lift up Solomon to you as, as he has a testing tomorrow. Lord, we pray for everything to go smoothly with that. We lift up Lisa to you as she has an operation next week. I lift up Sean to you as he's looking for another job. Lord, would you be with all these guys that are going through challenging times right now? And Lord, we do lift up this building to you. God, would you, would your will be done? Uh, would you give us favor with the city and favor with the neighborhood board as we have to go back and, and do an amendment to our CUP? Lord, we do pray that this, uh, that this little road bump, speed bump, wouldn't really put us back too far, but Lord, that you would uh, rule and overrule in the affairs of men. And so go before us, Lord, as a church, Calvary Chapel, Milwani, we commit ourselves to you. Uh, Lord, have your way with us and help us to continually be obedient to your leading on our lives. So we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I'm so stoked because I'm excited to see really how the Lord is going to move in this. I, do I know how he's going to move? Absolutely not. I have no idea. And that's not a bad place to be. But where it's a great place to be is right in the center of the Lord's will. And so I want to commit all these things to him I mean this building is is coming up it's gonna pretty soon there's gonna be a building right where we're sitting we have to break ground this year or we get to sell this land back to castle and cook so we I mean this year is already a month in we have 11 more months to begin the building process here on this property so continue to pray and I, I think for us the biggest thing is continue to pray that the Lord would build his church and what I mean by that I don't mean the building necessarily, but I mean that the Lord would continue to build each and every one of us. That as we get into his word, as we're discipled, as we get into the studies, as we fellowship together, as we're filled with his spirit, that the Lord would continue to build us and have his way in our lives. And so I want to con continually ask you guys to pray for that. And what is the most important part of any church, of any building? if you're an engineer it's the foundation I mean those of you that, that know anything about buildings the foundation is the most important part if you don't get the foundation right what happens to your building <laughs> was that a bug or was that a, is it coming? <laughs> the building's coming down and the bug is going away I know I was like where's this bug coming from 
if you don't have a good foundation, that building's coming down. Yeah. And that's why we have Corey, and there's like 17 million, I don't even know how many engineers there are that are working on the building <laughs> to make sure that that thing is stable and gonna be able to survive the test of time. But it's the same is true spiritually. That the foundation for us spiritually is the most important thing. The foundation is the most important. And what is the foundation? I, I love 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. It says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid. There is a foundation and the foundation that will be laid. And what is the foundation that's laid in the believer's life, in the church's life? The foundation that's laid is Jesus Christ. This is the most important foundation of any person's life, of any church's life, is that they're built on Jesus Christ. The most important decision that you can ever make in your life is to come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That you realize that you're a sinner, that you realize that Jesus came to die for your sins. That He is the Savior. That He paid your price. The price that you should have paid on the cross, He paid Himself with His blood. That He took your place. He bought you with the price. It was His blood on the cross. And when you come to Him, when you acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, He fills you with His Spirit. He changes you from the inside out. This is the most important foundation ever, is the foundation of Jesus Christ. And as you have that foundation of Jesus Christ, He fills you fresh with His Spirit. And we talked about that last week. We talked about this filling, this fresh filling of the Spirit, that in order for us to do those things, those three things, in order for us to walk in love, in order for us to walk as light, in order for us to walk in wisdom, we must have a foundation on Jesus Christ and we must be filled with the Spirit. And then we talked about last Sunday, we talked about the four evidences of being filled with the Spirit. What were the four evidences? The first one was simple, fellowship. That the filling of the Spirit, the first evidence of being filled with the Spirit is that you fellowship with the people of God. You fellowship around your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second was worship. That worship comes from the heart. And I told you guys last week that I cannot sing like those ladies can sing. Let's just be realistic. There's probably several of us in here that are in the same boat as me, that the Lord has not gifted you with a singing voice. But Psalm 95 that I gave you last week, it said, make a joyful noise. Make a loud noise. That's what I do. I cannot make a melodious noise, so I make a joyful noise to the Lord. I worship the Lord out of my heart with singing and praise. And we were encouraged in that last week, that that's an evidence that you are filled with the Spirit, is that you worship God out of the heart. And then the third one was thanksgiving. That in all things, in all circumstances, you give thanks to God for the things that are going on in your life. And we talked about it, it's easy to give thanks for those good things. It's easy. But what happens when you run into those speed bumps? What happens when all of a sudden it's not going according to plan? What happens when there's hospital visits? What happens when there's setbacks with the doctors? What happens when these things occur in our lives? Are we able to give thanks and to God in the circumstances that we go through? And then we talked about the fourth evidence of being filled with the Spirit. The foundational evidence of being filled with the Spirit was submission, mutual submission to each other. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We, this is what we ended with last week. The fourth evidence of being filled with the Spirit. The foundational evidence, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission, that we were to love God and love others. Putting their needs above our own. Serving others, the others in our lives. And last week, uh, how do we end? We said, where is the filling of the Spirit most vital in the Christian's life? It's not in the workplace. It's not with your neighbors. It's not out there on mission. Being filled with the Spirit is most vital in your home. Because if it's not happening in your home, it's never going to happen at your workplace. If it's not happening in your home, it's not going to happen when you're out on the mission field. If it's not happening in your home, it's not going to happen with your neighbors and friends. It's not going to happen at school. It's not going to happen in those places where you walk if it doesn't happen in those places where you're sitting. That these evidences of being filled with the Spirit need to happen in our home, that this is the foundation and it's needed most in the home. And so Paul takes these four foundations 
of being filled with the Spirit, and he's now going to apply it to the most foundational place, the most foundational area in our lives, our homes. He's going to apply it to the relationship between a wife and a husband and a husband and a wife and the family. And then he's going to start talking about work and other areas. But the first thing he talks about is the home. And how does he start in verse 22? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Fun verse. (laughs) <laughs> Everybody's waiting to hear. I think it's so interesting because this might be one of the most controversial verses in Scripture. This verse, Ephesians 5.22, might be one of the most controversial verses in Scripture. Everybody gets here, they're like, they don't want to talk about it. It seems like we get to these three verses. There are three verses about wives right here that Paul talks about. It seems like we get, as a church, we get to these three verses about wives and we forget everything that we've learned. We totally forget the first five chapters of the book of Ephesians as soon as we get to these three verses. We take these three verses and we make them mean something totally that they do not mean. We get to them and all of a sudden, we get to these verses and we start to say, we take that word submit and we start to say, oh, that word submit, you need to obey me in everything, Marina. Every little thing, you need to be waiting on me hand and foot. We turn this word into obedience. And I think this word has, this, this verse here has been used by men to justify dictatorial behavior in the home. Yeah. It has. Because they take it totally out of context. They just take this verse and say, here it is in a vacuum. And you have to be obedient to everything I say. You know, when, when there's some muddy waters, when there's... I thought I saw Phil here. I'm looking for Phil and I can't say, where's Phil? Phil, where? He must be counting in the back. Oh, he's praying today. Every time I talk about this, I look at Phil because Phil knows when there's some muddy water, you go and you look and you go see what McGee says. Because Jay Vernon McGee is a smart guy. So I went and looked at what McGee said. I said, McGee, what, is this? what does this mean here? McGee? And McGee says this. This verse says, it is not wives obey your husbands submit is a loving word it means wives respond to your own husbands as you would respond to the lord the way you respond to the lord is that you love him because he first loved us wives that is what you're to do you're to love your husband as you love the lord as the Lord loved you. It's a very mild word. It's a loving word is what McGee says. Wives, how you respond to the Lord is to be how you respond to your husband. The foundation that you have in Jesus Christ before you're married is the foundation that you need to take into marriage. It just doesn't like you get married and you forget the foundation that you had before you went into marriage. No, Paul is saying the foundation that you have in Jesus Christ is the foundation that you need in marriage. How you love the Lord before you're married is how you need to love the Lord after you're married. And you respond to your husband in the same way, that you love him as you would love the Lord. This is what this verse is saying. I think it's so interesting because (laughs) I've seen it so much. Like, there's ladies, and they love Jesus. They're passionate about Jesus. But they need a guy. And all of a sudden, like, instead of trying to find their meaning and significance and purpose in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, like, there's like some crazy wires get crossed in women's brains. I don't know, ladies. I'm not a lady, so I just don't understand. I'm a guy looking at this from the outside, but there's some wires that all of a sudden get crossed. And all of a sudden, instead of looking to the Lord to provide meaning and purpose for your life, you you start looking to your husband to provide meaning and purpose and significance in your life. Ladies, I don't know if you noticed, but Every single man on this planet is flawed. <laughs> I just, I, I don't know what happens when that, I mean, you start to look to your husband. I was reading this commentary and I was just like, wow, this guy is amazing. This is what John Corson says about this phenomenon that goes on in Western culture. He says this, and he's speaking to the ladies. Husbands, you can listen in. This is John Corson. He's speaking to the ladies. And this is a little bit of a longer quote, but I'm going to give it to you. He says, dear sister. Dear sister in Christ, dear ladies, dear women, maybe you're not married yet. This is what he says. He says, as long as you look to your husband, 
to meet your deepest needs. You'll be frustrated perpetually. Yeah. Ladies, as long as you look, as as soon as that, that shift happens, as long as you look to your husband to meet your deepest needs, you will be frustrated perpetually. You will put pressure on him to be what he can't be because he's missing something. He's a sinner. He cannot meet these needs that you have. It's only while it's, it is only in Jesus Christ that you will find true fulfillment in talking to him, in learning of him, in walking with him. You will find the satisfaction your heart is craving. Drink deeply of the last Adam, the perfect one, Jesus Christ. For when you tap into him and maintain a vital, personal, daily devotional life, you won't push your husband to be something he cannot be. Wives, continue to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, just as you did before you were married. For it is only in him that you will find the answer to the cry of your heart. Your husband will not answer that cry in your heart. It's only in the Lord Jesus Christ that he will be able to answer that cry in your heart. <laughs> Men, we're flawed. We are absolutely flawed individuals. And I think it's so interesting because as you look to the Lord, as you love the Lord, as you submit to him, you begin to do the same for your husband, understanding very clearly that your husband is broken. Just like you, I'm, I'm broken. I mess up all the time. Ask my wife. She's right there. She will tell you that I mess up all the time. In fact, last night we had, we have 20 people in my house. 20 people! <laughs> we had a huge meal last night. Huge meal. And part of the meal is rice. And so I'm used to Josh coming over to my house. I have to make like seven cups of rice when Josh comes over because Josh loves rice. And so I go, I go into the back. I, Lorena makes the rice. I go into the back. She doesn't usually make the rice, but this time she made the rice. I go into the back. I come back out and the rice is done. I open up the rice and there's like four cups of rice in there. And there's 20 people. I'm like, this is not enough rice. This isn't it. And I was looking at Lorena, you did not make it. You have ruined the dinner. There's not enough rice here. And my sister's like, it's going to be okay. We're homies. This is going to be totally fine. And what my sisters were absolutely right. I got into the flesh, man. I, was, I showed my brokenness last night with my wife by getting on her case about only making four cups of rice. My mom told her to make more cups of rice because <laughs> she didn't want leftover rice because when you cook for 20 people you end up having like I don't understand how you get so many leftovers when you cook for so many people I need to have Josh over to finish up all the Kahlua pig <laughs> Man. but this is what it is that I'm flawed as you submit to the Lord and then you and love and follow the Lord and you begin to take that same attitude towards your husband you immediately see your husband is flawed like Oh my goodness, my husband is getting on my case over rice. This is oh, like the silliest thing to get on my wife's case about, but I did, why? Because I'm flawed, I'm broken on the inside. I have a sin nature just like everyone else. There's little things that irritate me. I love having enough food for everyone. I hate running out of food. I think like Troy like instilled that in me at the men's, but you have to have enough food for everyone. Man. Wives, you cannot stop looking to the Lord for your purpose, meaning, and fulfillment, especially as you get married. You cannot stop because you're going to, as you start following, submitting, lovingly following your husband, you're going to realize he's broken. You're going to realize he's going to make mistakes. And what you're going to do, what you're going to be able to say is, that's okay. I'm not trusting any lie. I'm trusting in the Lord. It's okay for Eli to make mistakes. It's okay. He's going to come around and he's going to repent later. And he's going to do it in front of the entire church. <laughs> it's okay. And so Paul is sitting here saying, it's okay. This is the order that husbands and wives, he's saying husbands and wives are equal before the Lord. But there's an order of authority that goes on in a family. That God gave man the authority to make decisions in the family. And along with that authority, men, you also have the 
responsibility for those decisions. And that's challenging, guys. You have the responsibility before the Lord for the decisions that you make in your home, the direction that you take spiritually, the direction that you take, you know, as you go through life, you have the responsibility. It's the order that God has laid down. And he's done this from the beginning. Notice what he says in the next two verses. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. From the beginning, God gave man that authority. God gave man that responsibility. And he begins to use this beautiful picture of the church. He begins to use this picture and says, just as Jesus in the church is a model for what this relationship should look like, this is how you're to follow and submit and love your husband. This is what the Christian marriage should look like. I think it's so interesting because just as the church submits and lovingly follows Jesus, this is what the wife is to do with her husband. Submit and lovingly follow her husband's. Ladies, this is, guys, you can listen in. This isn't for you. Ladies, this is hard. Let's just be real. Lovingly following and submitting to your husband is hard. Why? There's two reasons, I think. And I'm not a lady, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. First reason, this is reason according to Eli. This is my opinion. The second reason is God's fact. Opinion of Eli is that men are broken and they're sinners. And we make mistakes. Women, you see that mistakes that we make. And so it makes it challenging for you to follow your husband. That's just, we're sinners. And you're like, yeah, I don't want to follow you. You're a sinner. But you forget that you're a sinner too. Like, that's the first reason. The second reason, biblical, that was just an aside for you. That was, that was a free one. The second reason that submission is so hard is because submission goes against your human nature. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there was a time that this whole earth was perfect. This whole world lived in perfection and in harmony with each other and with the Lord. But then there was sin. You guys know sin. What happened? There's the fruit and the eating and, and the falling and the skinning of animals and all kinds of things. But there was a curse that was put on this whole creation as well as humanity. In Genesis 3.16, let me just read to you what the Lord tells the woman in Genesis 3.16. There's two things that we can pull out of this. The first thing he says is that your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Women, you have a hard time submitting because it goes against your fallen nature. You don't want to submit. In fact, you want to be the one that gives, that has the authority. This is what the curse is all about. It says that you want to be the one that has the authority. You don't want to submit. And then, guys, did you notice what it says in there? It says that we, we also have fallen. We are also under a curse. That we will want to rule over. We will want to be the dictator. I always remember, you know, when Pastor Rick would teach on this, he would always say, I'm the Rick-tator in my marriage. I can't be the Eli-tator. That really, that doesn't flow too well. But I have a tendency in my marriage to want to be that dictator. Why? Because I have a fallen nature and I want to rule over. Just like the women. Submitting is extremely difficult for you because it goes against your fallen human nature. Where you say, I don't want to submit. I don't want to lovingly follow. I don't want to follow this guy because I want to lead. I want to be the ruler. I want to be the one that leads. Man. And here's the thing. Wives, husbands. The word of God is very clear. It teaches very clearly that submission is what needs to happen in a marriage that marriage to walk forward in the blessing of the Lord. That both the husband and the wife have to make a choice in marriage. There has to be a choice of the will in marriage. That as a husband, I have to make a choice of the will that I am going to serve God. I have to make that choice. And it's the same choice that a wife has to make. The wife has to make that choice that I will serve the Lord. This is the first choice that has to be made in any marriage. As soon as you, I mean, what is what Paul is talking about here? I'll just give, he's talking about Christian marriage. He is not speaking at all about unequally yoked marriages. It's just, that's not what he's talking about. It's, this is impossible in an unequally yoked marriage. This is impossible in a marriage of the world. But 
In a Christian marriage, this is possible. Why? Because it's the wife making a decision that I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. It's a wife making a decision saying, I, as I follow the Lord, I'm going to do to my husband as, a, as what I do to the Lord. I'm going to love my husband. I'm going to follow my husband as he makes decisions in our family, spiritually, as well as in this world. I'm going to lovingly follow. I'm going to submit. And husbands, I mean, we have that same choice. We have to choose that we are going to follow the Lord. It has to be our choice. And we also, husbands, you need to remember that the command in verse 21 that we started with applies to you. Submitting to each other, to one another, out of the reverence of Christ. That you're to submit in your marriage. Well, Eli, if I'm to submit, my wife is to submit, what is this marriage even going to look like? It can't happen that we're submitting to each other. And uh, what are you talking about? It's impossible to follow the command of 21 and 22. Uh, it just doesn't work. I wonder if there's a example that the Bible lays out talking about submission in marriage in the home. started looking at Abraham and Sarah. It's so fun because we've been reading through that. If you've been reading through the Bible with us this year, you've been reading through and reading about Abraham and Sarah. And how is Abraham and Sarah an example of submission and mutual submission? Well, the first thing is, you, I mean, you can look at Sarah. Can you just put yourself way back in the day, you, you're living in a city, got a nice house in the city, and all of a sudden one day your husband comes to you and says, honey, the Lord told me we are going to move to the we're going to move hundreds of miles away. No family, no friends, no nothing. We're going to take our my nephew Lot with us, you know, and we're just going to go. We're going to live in a tent. Let's, let's go. I don't know about you. I'm not living in a tent. If I was Sarah, I'd be like, wait a minute. <laughs> Time out. I'm not going in this. But she submits. She lovingly follows her husband and goes with him to Canaan land. She lovingly follows as he goes and says, I'm following the Lord. Honey, come along. Let's go. We're going to follow the Lord together. And so Sarah goes along with her husband. And that's a great positive picture. But what about a negative picture? Well, there's two negative pictures about Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. Like Abraham's flaws. You guys know Abraham's flaws. Like one of the first things that happens, I think it's Genesis chapter 12 and uh, what are the, Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 20. Abraham does things. All right, let's, he goes, and when he goes in, into a people group, he says, honey, you just got to tell these people that you're my sister. <laughs> what does Sarah do? She lovingly follows her husband. It's interesting, we don't have a picture of what goes on in the home. Like if Sarah and Abraham had a robust discussion about this, we don't get that picture, but we get the end result in that even when Abraham does something that's not right, Sarah's lovingly following him, submitting to him. And when Abraham and Sarah are found out, who holds the responsibility? Well, Abraham holds the responsibility for the decision that he made. The, it's so funny because he gets he gets caught once and then he does it again in chapter 20. I'm like, you would think that men would learn from our mistakes. And Sarah, she knows he got caught the first time. And even in chapter 20, she keeps following him. Like, this is a picture of submission. That Sarah wasn't trusting in Abraham, she's trusting in the Lord. She says, even though my husband is wrong, even though he's not doing what's right, I'm going to lovingly follow him, I'm gonna, and, and the Lord is going to deal with my husband. And who deals with Abraham? God deals with Abraham, as Sarah lovingly follows him. And so we have this picture of submission that's going on with Abraham and Sarah. But now, I love it because we also have a picture of like the behind-the-scenes look. We get to see into the intimacy of Abraham's and Sarah's marriage as they lovingly submit to each other. And what do I mean by that? Well, you guys know the story of Abraham and Sarah. I don't have to recount it for you. But God gives the promise. You know, Isaac is going to be born, right? God says, Isaac's going to be born. And then what happens? What happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. Sarah doesn't get pregnant. God gave a promise, Sarah doesn't get pregnant, and so what happens? What happens? Sarah, we have a behind the scenes look 
right? Sarah comes to Abraham, and this isn't, she's not doing this in front of everybody. Come on. She's, they're, they're having an intimate conversation. It's recorded for our benefit. They're having a conversation together, and Sarah's like, you know what, I'm not getting pregnant. Abraham, I don't, like, what would she call him? I don't know. You know, his name was Abram back then. Abram, I'm not getting pregnant. Why don't you go have a have a kid with my concubine, with my with my handmaiden, with my servant from Egypt? And that's how God will give us a son. That's how the promise will be fulfilled. That is foolishness. Abraham, being a man of faith, you have to know that Abraham knew this was foolishness. You have to know that, all right? But what does it say in Genesis chapter 16, verse 2? It says this very clearly. Abram listened to the voice of of Sarai. There was Abraham submitting under his wife's opinion. As they had a conversation in private, Abraham said, you know what? I'm going to make that decision that, and I'll be responsible. And because of that decision, we have all kinds of trouble today, just so you know. We're still having some consequences because of this decision that's made thousands and thousands of years ago. Because it was out of the will of God. But Abraham submitted to his wife's counsel. It happened. And then, then, you know, Ishmael comes along and all the fun stuff that happens with that. And then 13 years later, mm -hmm. Isaac is born with Sarah. And again, again, you know, Sarah comes up to Abraham. We get to see behind the scenes again as they have a little robust discussion again. And this is what happens in Genesis chapter 21, verses 10 through 11. So Sarah said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And what does it say about Abraham? And this thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. They had a discussion in private. And this time, Abraham told his wife, Sarah, junk your idea. <laughs> I don't like that idea. Ishmael's my son. That was his son. I'm not going to cast that guy out. This is a terrible idea. I'm not going to do this. He doesn't, his wife gives him counsel. And this time, you guys know, this is godly counsel. So when Sarah gives him not godly counsel, he listened to her, but when she gave him godly counsel, he ignores it. <laughs> that sounds like a typical guy to me. <laughs> like when our wives are being spiritual, full of the spirit, and giving us godly counsel, we're like, that is a terrible idea. And then when they're giving us like a terrible idea, we're like, oh, I should try that. That, that, that sounds great. Right. I think I should do Come on! But this is what he's, I mean, this is what goes on. And in the very next verse, verse 12, God has to come to Abraham and says, listen to your wife because that's from me. You need to listen to your wife is what God tells him. Because that's from, so we see this picture that Abraham, there's mutual submission that goes on behind closed doors in that marriage. That Abraham had learned to value the counsel of his wife. That Abraham had learned this lesson. And I give this lesson in marriage counseling. And who was a lot, I think it was, Alexander and Leilani were probably the last ones that I gave pre-marriage counseling to. And I, I sat there and I said, Leilani, this is going to go against your nature. But you are to lovingly submit and follow. Ale you're, you're to follow Alexander. This is what you're to do in your, in, in your marriage. And I turned to Alexander and I said, Alexander, uh, God's going to deal with you when you're wrong. <laughs> but you are to lovingly lead in your family. To lovingly lead is Christ. You're to love Leilani as Christ loved the church. I mean, this is going to be your responsibility as you as you go into marriage. And then, then I looked at, I said, Leilani, there is, if I could teach you guys one thing, this is what I want to teach you. Leilani, you need to understand that Alex comes from a different family than you. Every family, every family is different. Every family, they're raised differently. There's different circumstances that go on. There's all kinds of challenges that go on in any I don't care what family you are, there's challenges that happen in your family. And so I looked at Leilani, I said, Leilani, you need to understand that Alexander has had a different upbringing than you, even though you've both been raised in the church. You guys do not think alike. You don't, especially because you're guys and girls. I mean, guys, we don't think the same way as girls do. 
I don't know how girls think. It, it's like a mystery to me how my wife thinks. I just, I don't know. But I have to dwell with her in an understanding way, learning how she thinks. And so I tell Leilani, I said, Leilani, you need to value and appreciate the opinion of your husband, of Alexander. You're going to need to learn to value and appreciate these, the input that he brings into your marriage. And I turned to Alexander and I said, Alexander, it's the same for you. As the man especially, you need to value and appreciate Leilani's counsel. Because she thinks differently than you. And sometimes the Lord is going to speak through her. The Lord speaks a lot through my wife. I've learned over the years, one of the most important things I've learned in marriage is that God can speak through my wife, Lorena. And I need to appreciate and value the counsel and advice that she brings in to our situations that face our family. Because I don't care what family you're part of, there are going to be trials and situations that you're going to face, period. Any family is going to face challenges. The two of you are going to be one flesh that you guys need to come together, that you guys need to value each other's opinions. You need, there are going to be times, and every single one of you that is married understand this. Those of you that are not married yet, you do not know yet, and that's okay. But I'm just giving you a sneak peek. And you think there's gonna be times where you have a private, robust discussion. And those of you that have boyfriends, you're like, I'm never gonna have a robust discussion. <laughs> I just don't love. Good luck! <laughs> you will have a robust discussion! It will happen! You will have it behind closed doors. Wives, you will forget in that moment to value and appreciate your husband's op opinion. Husbands, you will forget in that moment to value and appreciate your wife's opinion. And you will have a robust discussion. It's going to happen at some point. And then you go and you make a decision. And all these things happen. I had a family that was thinking about moving to the mainland. I said, the most important thing that you guys need to think about as you move to the mainland is this, that you're one flesh and you make this decision together. I don't care what decision you make, whether you decide to stay here in Hawaii or whether you decide to go to the mainland, you make the decision together. That husband, you need to, you need to value and appreciate the advice that your wife and opinion that your wife gives into this decision that you're gonna make. Wife, you need to appreciate the, the things that your husband is telling you. And then you guys need to pray about it together. You need to bring it before the Lord and make a decision. And as soon as that decision is made, the reason that you do that, because as soon as that decision is made, it becomes our decision. We made this decision. Even if Lorena doesn't agree with me in private, when we make a decision in public, we made a decision. We did. Not Eli made a decision, not Lorena made a decision, we made a decision we're one flesh we make it's not when it goes bad you know my wife should not come to me in private and say i told you so <laughs> that happens ladies I don't, should not happen my, lorena doesn't do that just saying i've seen it happen but you need to be unified in the decisions that are made in your house and when you're unified in the decisions that are made in your house that doesn't happen why because you guys made that decision together and as you guys make that decision together then the whatever happens in that decision it doesn't matter because you made it together you have decided this together and good things happen bad things happen doesn't matter we're going to face it together because we felt in that moment that this is what god was calling us to do we talked about it we prayed about it and we went for it and this is what happens and this is what he's talking about here, that husbands and wives, that decision that you make in private, when you're in public, there can't be, well, my wife was the one that really made that decision. I, just, I, don't, I did not agree with her. No, you guys are one in public. This is submission. You might not, Lorena might not have agreed with me. I might not have agreed with her, but in public, we are unified. We made that decision. No, we're not gonna talk bad about each other. We're not gonna say anything negative about our wife or anything. We made that decision together. We are unified. We're walking through life unified together. In private, we might have some discussions, but in public, we're unified. This is what I told Alexander and Leilani. The most important thing that you can learn in going into a marriage is how to communicate and value that your, your spouse. Because God has given you that spouse. She's filled with the Spirit just as much as I'm filled with the Spirit. We need to, I need to love and value her. And that's what this mutual submission looks like. John Corson says this, there are times 
when I need to listen to my wife. There are times when I must choose to submit to what she's saying, realizing the Lord can speak through her. Therefore, it is the wise husband who says to his wife, I want to hear your heart and mind on this matter and match it against the word of God because I know I am the one who will ultimately be held responsible. And suddenly, rather than being a justification for me to be dictatorial over my wife, Ephesians 5.22 humbles me before the Lord realizing I am held accountable for the direction of my family. Paul writes Ephesians 5.22 to the ladies. I think it's so interesting because we take it completely on its own in isolation. But you know the word submit isn't even in Ephesians 5.22. The Greek reading of Ephesians 5.22 is wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. The word submit isn't even in there. Why? Because the word submit is found in verse 21. And so he's just saying in a continuation of what you should be doing as you're filled with the Spirit, do a special, bring that into your marriage. It is vital for you to bring that into your marriage. I mean, wives, this is a high calling. Wearsby says, clearly, this does not mean that your wife becomes a slave. For the husband is also to submit to Christ. And if both are living under the lordship of Christ, there can be only harmony. Headship is not dictatorship. Each for the other, both for the Lord. Each of us should be for each other. We should have each other's back as we go through life. And both of us should be following the Lord because we're one flesh. It's vital in any marriage. And wives, this is impossible in your own power. You cannot follow this in your own power which is why you have to take it in the context that it's written in you have to take it understanding you must be filled with the spirit in order to follow the commands that paul is laying out here there's no other way to do this there's no other way to lovingly submit to your husband there's no other way to walk like this unless you're filled with the very spirit of god it's impossible and then <laughs> i think it's interesting because guys i mean we forget what happens before these three verses, and we also forget everything that happens after these three verses. It's like we just take these verses in isolation, but they're not written in isolation. Husbands, I don't have time to give it all to you today. <laughs> but I need to tell you something. Just look at verse 25. Husbands, agape. Not only are husbands to have that mutual submission with their wife, or with their wife, this is so interesting because Paul takes it even to another level with husbands. He says, wives, you're just a continuation of being filled with the Spirit. You just bring that into your marriage. Husbands, I've got a word for you. Agape, your wives. As Christ agape the church and gave himself up for her. Paul brings it up a whole level for the guys. We don't, we don't want to talk. Guys, it's so interesting, guys. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about how we're supposed to agape our wives. Yeah. Husbands, it is impossible in your own power to agape your wife. The only way you can do this is if you're filled with the Spirit. Just like it's impossible for the wife to sub lovingly submit and follow her husband, the only way she can do it is if she's filled with the Spirit. Both are impossibilities, but for the men it's even harder. Agape does not come naturally to us. The other types of love may come naturally to us, but agape does not come naturally. You, we must be filled with the Spirit. What is unconditional? This is... There's two things. This love is an unconditional love. Agape is unconditional. It sacrifices for the other, just as Jesus sacrificed for me, even to his death. Why? So that I could be saved, so that I could be filled with the Spirit, so that I could become the man that he created me to be, going on this process of life. This is what Jesus did for me. And this is, as men, this is what we're to be doing for our wives, encouraging them in the Lord to become the woman that God created them to be not an easy thing to do. Why? Because we're naturally selfish. Guys, we're naturally selfish. But, I mean, we'll be realistic here for a moment. Men, we're naturally selfish. We don't want to be the sacrificial love for our wives. But we're not only to love sacrificially, we're also to love unconditionally. And the last time I looked, unconditionally meant it didn't matter if my wife made a good meal or not. I'm to love her anyways. It didn't matter if she did this thing or that thing. I'm to love her anyways. There's an unconditional love, not dependent upon what she has done for me. I am to unconditionally love my wife as Christ unconditionally loved me. Too often, I think, guys, we fail in this area. And when we fail in this area, what do we do? Well, 
we do what the first Adam did. Lord, it's the woman you gave me. It's all her fault. She didn't submit, so therefore I didn't love unconditionally. No, no, no. Men, you are held responsible. You have the authority, and you're held responsible. The responsibility is upon you to love, un love your wife unconditionally. I mean, I think we have it backwards. Men, as we get close to finishing here, men, be the change that you want to see in your marriage. All of you young men that aren't married yet, start now. Love God now. Because if you can learn to love God now, if you can learn to be filled with the Spirit now, if you can learn to have a foundation in Jesus Christ and on His Word, a lot of these things are going to be much easier for you as you go into marriage. Because you're going to have that foundation on the Lord. Husbands, be that change now that you want to see in your marriage. John Corson says very clearly, submission is never a problem when a man loves his wife as Christ loved the church. As soon as a man begins to love as Christ loved the church, submission becomes easy. It's easy to follow somebody who sacrificially and unconditionally loves you. I will follow that person that sacrificially and unconditionally loves me. Women, wives, ladies, be the change that you want to see. Especially for, for you ladies that are married. Be the change that you want to see in your marriage. I want to challenge you guys this week. Because I think this happens so much in our culture. Because it happened from the very beginning. I want to challenge you this week. If you are married. This week. Do not point a finger at your spouse. And you start thinking about that. And you think that's going to be pretty good to do that. No, you can't. <laughs> you cannot. This week, I want to challenge you spouses, late husbands and wives. This is the challenge that I think is really, it's not my challenge. This is from the Lord. Do not point a finger this week in your marriage. Every time you point a finger this week, go and apologize to your spouse. I'm sorry I pointed it out. I should have done that. Every time. Do not point a finger this week in your marriage. There's, there's too many. I mean, women, lovingly follow your husband as you follow the Lord. Men, love your wives sacrificially and unconditionally as Jesus loves us sacrificially. What does that mean? You go back to my favorite, favorite verse, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? It means that Christ loved me sacrificially and unconditionally when I hated him. I was treating him like garbage. That's when he died for me. Husbands, you are to love your wives when your wife is treating you like garbage. That is what that means. If you take it literally, if you take the scriptures literally, this is what this means. Do not point the finger. Die when your wife treats you like trash. This is the command for the husbands. It's, and not, wives, lovingly follow your husband. Even when he's going to make a mistake because you're going to, you're trusting in the Lord. That the Lord is going to make it right. Sacrificially and unconditionally. I mean, what does this look like? Lorena and I, I mean, for the first the first year of marriage was, you know, it's a lovely, lovely time. You got the, the honeymoon phase. And then what? The reality comes. And I mean, after just a few moments, because each one of us were selfish in our marriage. It became, we're like enemies in the same, under the same roof. The, the finger pointing would happen all the time. What did it take? What did it take? It took one of us getting right with the Lord and saying, you know what, Lord? I don't care what it costs. I am going to do what you called me to do in this marriage, regardless of how the other person responds. I will follow your commands. That's what it took in our marriage. And it did not change overnight. It did not. It took three months. For some people, it takes longer than other people. It took three months for, for us to start really seeing some change in our marriage. But it, it takes one of you guys just to say, I am going to put down the weapon of pointing fingers. I'm going to put that weapon down. I'm going to put down that weapon of my tongue. Because this thing... That's what I got here. It's, like, it's terrible. It's like a viper. It's terrible. I'm going to put down the weapon of my tongue. 
What does the Bible say? Let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up as fits the occasion. Uh, every time I'm about to say some cutting remark, I'm going to bite my tongue. And that's hard. Husbands, wives, put down the weapons this week. If there's been weapons that have happened in your marriage, put them down this week. This week, put the fingers down. Put that tongue away. And say, I'm going to follow the commands of the Lord this week. Young people, those of you that aren't married yet, there's going to be a day when you will be. And you've seen, with your parents, you've seen that marriage can be challenging. The thing I appreciate about my parents is that I saw the flaws. They weren't hiding the mistakes that they made. They weren't trying to put on a front. They told us that they made mistakes. They apologized for their mistakes. Even though I was spanked every day as a child. That was a... <laughs> I needed it. I did need it. I mean, seriously. Seriously, I needed it. Young people, get a foundation for the Word of God. Because here's the thing, the foundation has to be Jesus Christ. If your foundation is not Jesus Christ, if you're looking for your girlfriend, if you're looking for your boyfriend, if you're looking for that guy to satisfy and meet your needs, it won't end well. You need to learn to find your satisfaction, meaning, and purpose in Jesus Christ. You need to. And the only way to do that is to be passionate about Him and passionate about His Word. And then, like we talked about last week, put into practice the commands that he tells you to do. Put them into practice when you're young. Because as you get older, you'll be walking in those things already. And all of those guys that are fake, you're going to ignore. All of those girls that are fake, you're going to ignore. Because you're waiting for that one that God has for you. And you'll know it when you see it. Guaranteed. And so for me, this is the put down the weapons this week. Men, take responsibility in your marriages. Take responsibility to agape this week. Women, lovingly follow your husband this week. And see, just see, as you obey the Lord, see what the Lord is going to do. Because the last time I checked, the Lord does exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask of him. And that's the story of our marriage, that God has done exceedingly abundantly above all that the Lord have asked or thought as we've decided to follow the Lord. So Father, we do commit ourselves to you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, as we spend some time now hearing from a young couple of the things that you're doing in their lives, Lord, encourage us as a body to put down those weapons, to put down the fingers and the tongues this week, and to really follow the commands that you set for us in your word. And so help us, Lord, to be changed. Change us from the inside out. And so we trust you for these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to this morning we have a very special, special time. Sean, Krista, Sharoma, baby Enoch, we are going to have a baby dedication. Sean and Krista have been praying last year. They were praying. You guys can come up as you guys are coming up. They were praying last year. Um, and they spent time together as a couple. And they were asking the Lord, you know, Lord, where, do you, where would you have us? And the Lord showed them to come to Calvary Chapel, Milwaukee. And so they're here with us starting in January. Hi. babies at my house right now. It's great. But they're coming to our church. I'm so stoked. I've known Sean for a while. I've known Krista for forever. All said she was, I think, I think you were at our wedding. I think there was a picture of you at our wedding. <laughs> we have a Polaroid of that. <laughs> Rena, do you have that paper for me? Uh, it's really cool because for us, a baby dedication just isn't about little baby Enoch, although it is. Because Enoch is awesome. He's so cute. But it's a baby dedication is really about a family because a baby like is not in a vacuum by himself little baby Enoch is you're not in a vacuum by yourself you've got a great mom and dad and so a baby dedication for us is really a family dedication that it's a husband and wife coming together and saying man we want to follow the Lord we want to serve the Lord and we want to raise our kid the right way we want to raise baby Enoch the right way and so I'm going to read this to you guys and then we're going to have a chance to hear from you this is what the baby dedication we have these great little baby dedications to you guys when you guys have little little children. This is what it says. Parents of Enoch, Elijah, Isami, Sharoma, that's you. <laughs> this is what it says. It says, we agree that our child, that baby Enoch here, is a gift from the Lord. 
that we thank the Lord and treasure our gift. That we realize that in order to dedicate our child to the Lord, first we as parents must be dedicated to the Lord. Therefore, on our part, we commit our lives to Jesus Christ in the presence of you all, the church, our friends, and our fellowship. We also commit ourselves to pray daily for our child, to provide a Christ-like atmosphere in our home, to instruct our child in the ways of Jesus Christ, to abide by the biblical standards of child discipline and lovingly correct in a faithful and patient manner. That's really hard. That just... <laughs> and, the, and the last one actually next to the last one to love our child, building up our child and to try and instill a lifelong uh, a lifestyle of abiding in the faith hope and love that reflects our child's personal relationship with Jesus Christ um, it is our desire as parents and as a family to live our lives before God in such a way that in the end we hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your master. So we're going to have you guys sign that at the end here. But I, part of the best part of dedicating a child is getting to hear from the parents. And so, Sean, you can pass. For a volunteer, not I didn't tell them what the story was about, but I asked them for a volunteer. Apparently, most of them already knew the story, so none of them rose their hands. And I didn't realize this, but Krista said, I guess they thought that they were gonna have to wash my feet, you know. Um, so I, I asked another question, like, oh, um, who has the stinkiest feet here? And it was crazy sock night, so they all had, they all had their crazy socks on. And um, so, you know, they're all lifting up their feet like, oh, pick me, you know, I have the stickiest feet. Uh, and one of the kids was like, oh, uh, I have fungus on my feet. You know? uh, I thought he was just joking, but Krista said he probably had fungus on his feet. Uh, but, uh, but just thinking about that story, like uh, in marriage, uh, I so often feel like I want to be the one served like those kids, you know, that I wanted to be the one getting my wash feet by Krista or by Enoch. Um, later on I guess but uh, in marriage and in parenthood I have to be the one to serve like Eli, Eli said um, I have to be the one to love my wife just as Christ loved the church and um, and if I'm super honest bare bones honest uh, the past six months of raising him and being married it's been super tough um, it's been rough and um, We've had tons of robust uh, discussions, private, right? Robust discussions, and um, man, like the Lord has really been um, refining me and cultivating me and scraping me and uh, just showing me how much I still have to grow and I still have to. There's things I didn't even think about when I was single and um, not married that I have to think about now, and um, and so it's just a reminder that yeah, God has still a lot of work. For me and at first i thought i was going to be you know going into marriage and getting married i was like oh man i'm going to be a rock star husband i'm cef trained um i went to a i went to a christian college i studied the book of ephesians you know i have um ephesians 525 on my ring like it's going to be awesome um but man the lord has really humbled me uh, and has really been showing me how much i still have to um i still have to follow his example in loving Krista and loving Enoch, um, unconditionally, unconditionally agape love. And so that's, that's how God has been loving me. Okay, I guess my time is up. <laughs> on the Lord our whole lives knowing the Lord and then when you get to that age of like oh, wow I get to marry and then it's like you try to find all of your um, fulfillment from your husband and that was me like ever since I was a little kid probably like 10 I've been wanting to be married and um, you can 
can ask my parents who we went to Disneyland when I was 10 years old and I could care less about the rides. You know, my whole dream has been to be a mom and a wife and I'm just concerned about all the little kids running around. Are any of them orphans? I want to talk. And then, you know, you go to high school and you get asked that question, oh, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like, to be honest, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. You know, that sounds really bad. I don't want to, like, go out there and, and make a lot of money, but I mean, that was my whole dream. And 16 years later, um, God really answered my prayer and, you know, I met my Prince Charlie. And, and then we had a son and it's like, wow, all of my dreams in my life have come true, you know, after waiting for a long time. And, uh, <laughs> and so then recently, you know, we've only been married a year and a half. And since pretty much day one, you know, I've asking my husband, oh, so isn't marriage wonderful? You know, we're in that honeymoon stage and don't you wish this could just last forever? Like we made vows and it's supposed to last for a lifetime. Can't you imagine like if this lasted into heaven and forever and ever and ever? And he's like, well, wifey, there's there's a greater good out there. And it's like, what? <laughs> I don't want to hear that. You know, like what are you talking about? And it's like that Incredibles quote, like, I am your wife. Like I am the greatest good you're ever going to get. <laughs> time so just love on me you know? <laughs> and but he tells me no like he kept telling me over and over in that first year you know um, my goal is to point you to the marriage that one day will be you know when the, the church is going to be married to Christ and this marriage is just a foreshadowing of a perfect marriage to come that will last for eternity forever and and I'm like oh I don't know, man. That doesn't sound so good right now. <laughs> I just got married to you, you know? But um, I guess over this year, you know, God has really been working in my heart because up until this point, it was like I was so focused on getting married and finding my calling in life. And now that it's here, it's like I'm wondering what's next? You know, is there more to life? And I think God has really been working in my heart that there is more. And this is just pointing to the eternal things to come. And it's just a foreshadowing of something amazing. That the Lord has for those who love Him, and so that's what I've been learning. Um, and yeah, and so like I had that verse written down, Ephesians three twenty through twenty one, um, that now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, Amen. And so. Um, when we love the Lord and we're joined with Christ, like that's that's the greatest thing, you know. And so we just need to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord as women who are not married and who are married, because this is not the end. So, yeah. Awesome. I just want you to come on up. We got some. I know I have some verses for this young family. I know Pastor Clay has some verses as well. But I was praying, like, what are what 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 does the Lord want to do? And Sean, for you, um, I really felt like the Lord was just wanted to encourage you to build up your discernment and wisdom and understanding so that as the leader of your family, especially in the days that we live in, that as you follow the Lord, He will show you what you need to do as a leader. And the verse was 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And it's talking about the sons of Issachar, uh, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And I felt that that was appropriate for you, that you would have understanding of the times, that you have the wisdom and discernment to know what your family ought to do in these days that we live in, especially with the family that God has really blessed you with. So I just wanted to encourage you with that. And Krista, for you, it was, I mean, I think I gave this to you a long time ago. It's, I probably have. But every time I, I think of Krista, I always think of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, where it was, do not let your uh, adorning be merely external, the braiding of your hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious and I've always seen that passion that you have for the Lord internally that you want to serve him and follow him and in God's sight that's very precious and Enoch for you I was I was trying to not pick the verse that Pastor Clay was going to pick and I thought I knew what he was going to pick and so I was praying about it and, it, and the Lord just reminded me that when he grew up in Luke chapter 2 verse 52 and it says and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man and that's going to be my prayer for Enoch this morning is that 
just as Jesus did that as he grew up, that Enoch would do the same thing, that he would increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And so those are going to be my prayers for you this morning. I think Pastor Clay has something as well. Uh, what a blessing uh, to have family here today. And uh, Lisa and I are in our 30th year of our marriage. <laughs> and God has truly blessed. Um, in fact, yesterday was Lisa's birthday. So, happy birthday. Yeah. What a blessing. What a blessing. Grand, being a grandpa, how did that happen? And uh, it, it's, it's amazing, you know. Um, they told me I was going to be young forever, <laughs> you know. But being a grandpa, uh, one thing I've learned is um, you don't have to learn how to be a grandpa. It's exceeded all expectations, yeah. and man, it's automatic. You just grab the baby, and um, here's another lesson I learned. Grab the baby, throw him up in the air. <laughs> 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 Mistake number one, don't do that in front of your daughter. <laughs> Almost gave her a heart attack, and uh, I got the rebuke, Dad. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> but Enoch and I will have fun. We've been having great, a lot of fun. And uh, all right, so what? So so what are the things that I want to exhort you guys with? And I think it it comes from the lessons God is teaching me. And uh, right now, um, you know, it was Ephesians. Uh, today's lesson was really spot on. And the word submit, uh, submission, Eli's talked about that quite a bit today and kind of focused on that. But the lessons I think I'm still learning and God is still teaching me is submission has got to be to Him first and foremost. If we don't submit to the Lord and surrender to the Lord everything, uh, we're not going to get anywhere, you know. And I think that's the Lord is still teaching me that, that I need to submit to the Lord. And as we submit and the Lord reveals things in our life, we repent. And uh, that can only then bring about the changes um, that we talked about today. And we want to change and become more like Him. And the Lord is uh, teaching me. Those are lessons I'm still learning as we speak. And so I want to share that with you. And it reminded me of your, your wedding. Um, and it was just a real total blessing to be able to be a part of that. And one of the things I remember sharing as we, um, as you guys were getting married, and one of the things I shared was a triangle, that, that marriage triangle, that God is at the top, Sean, you're here, Krista, you're there, and it's not to focus on each other, but your primary role is to focus on the Lord. Hearing from the Lord, being obedient from, to the Lord, and the same thing with you, Krista. And as you both do that, the triangle gets smaller, and you guys will get closer to each other. So that's the that's the continued uh, message I want to share with you guys today. Is continue to do that. Submit to the Lord. Focus on Him, not on each other. And as you both do that individually, hey, you want to hear that? <laughs> oh man, it just melts you. You just fall in love with that all the time. Um, as you submit to the Lord, you grow, draw closer to, to each other. And here's the verse, Proverbs 22, 6. It says, to train up a child in the way of the Lord, and when he is old, he, you, he will not depart from it. In raising up Enoch, uh, several things with that. Here's all the practical stuff, right? Here, this is the practical part. The onus falls on you too. But as we learn, you're going to answer for your marriage, your family, your household, right? You're going to answer to that. But the best thing that you can do for Enoch is to be the examples. As Enoch, oh, excuse me. <laughs> see, I'm putting all the names together. <laughs> as Eli was sharing, Christianity begins in the home. And so it has to start, right? So you have your own individual devotions every day, your prayer life, your time in the Word, independent of anybody else but it's just you and the Lord okay e Enoch needs to grow up in that home and then you're gonna start your family devotions you're the leader the spiritual leader of the home you need to you need to establish that in the home where Enoch is a part of that you are pouring into him but the accountability for Enoch is crucial because as he lives out his life you're as parents gonna have to guide him and teach him right from wrong. That's where the discipline 
needs to come in when necessary. You need to use the wooden spoon. In fact, uh, we got a coal wooden oh, spoon no. made by Daniel. Oh, no. um, if, if, if you need, no, or not, not. I'm not talking like now. You know, I'm talking as he, I'm talking, at, you know, while he's growing up in the home, right? But the Lord um, gives us that that guidance where, if you need it, you know, you need to use that to to lovingly uh, discipline. You need to do that, right? So all of that is uh, important, practical and critical as um, as he grows up but agape is, is what, what what it's all about okay and okay we're gonna annoy him hey family would you guys come up okay we got uh, that the Lord would continue that work that he began in Sean and Krista, and that baby Enoch would grow up in that home uh, seeing the love of the Lord portrayed. And so would you guys just join with me? I'm gonna pray that Pastor Clay will close us, and it's good to have the whole family just as an encouragement, just to remind us, man, family is so vital, in, in, especially here in Hawaii. Family plays such an important role in the raising of kids. And so this morning as we dedicate Enoch the best way to do it is to dedicate him to the Lord and dedicate the family. So, Father, we do commit this young Sharoma family to you. Lord, I thank you for Sean. I thank you for the man that he is becoming. I thank you for uh, your truth that you're revealing to him in your word. I pray that he would have the discernment and the wisdom that he needs uh, to really follow you and to be the godly husband that you called him to be as well as the godly father uh, for Enoch that you've called him to be. I thank you for Krista, Lord, would you bless her. God, as she lovingly follows and submits to Sean, Lord, would you continue to do exceedingly abundantly above all that she could ask or think bless her lord uh be between them in their marriage and lord i pray right now uh, a little over baby not lord that he would grow in wisdom and stature and favor with god and man lord that you would bless him and that he would fulfill all of your purpose in his life lord use him in an amazing way and we commit this whole family to you god thank you lord jesus first of all we acknowledge you as our great god creator of all and uh, Father, we pray today, first of all, to acknowledge you, to give you thanks for all things. God, you have blessed. Thank you for this family, our family. Thank you for Enoch. We pray a special prayer for Daniel as he's at home in bed, that you would just touch him physically, restore him. Thank you for our son. God, we just uh, pray over Enoch, Lord. He belongs to you. Your word says that um, you created him. He is a gift from the Lord. Uh, the parents are stewards of what belongs to you. But Enoch is God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work. Father, we pray that your plans and purposes would be fulfilled in this young man's life, Lord. Just bless Enoch, raise him up. Give Sean and Krista all the grace they need to raise them in a godly home. And uh, thank you for all the family support that surrounds this uh, baby. Uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Cool. Do you grab a picture. One picture. Anybody else want a picture? You can do it really quick. Worship team, why don't you guys, you guys are already up. Yes. The lighting is terrible. Go in the sun. <laughs> One picture, yes. Maybe a few pictures. Why don't you guys stand with us? Let's sing a final song together. We got the worship team coming. They're ready. Oh, boys.